Thank you very much. It's great to join you here today. Uh, the theme of my talk is free speech is under attack in British universities. I believe that free speech and enlightenment values are under threat in our universities. Not all our universities, but certainly some. Not most students, but certainly a significant minority. In the worthy name of defending the weak and marginalized, some students are now adopting the unworthy tactic of seeking to close down open debate. And this is allied to a shift also in the way in which debates are conducted and who has a right to speak or who has authority to speak. I would say that in some universities, Debate is very much characterized by what I would call the politics of victimhood. Uh, the idea that being a victim of injustice or inequality automatically makes you right or automatically gives you a precedent to speak. Uh, this means that a person's right to be heard and taken seriously will, in some university campuses, <coughs> in some meetings, depend on their experience of discrimination, not on the quality of their arguments, the evidence they can marshal to support their case, or the longevity of their commitment to a cause. Everything too often boils down to, if you are a victim, you have more right and more authority to speak. And I think this is very dangerous, regressive politics. It has echoes, albeit in a very mild way, of the kind of zealousness of the Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution in China in the 1960s, when obsessed with finding real or imagined capitalist rotors, lots of good communists were witch-hunted and forced out and even physically assaulted uh, because they didn't tow the line of the Red Guards. Now, I think it's true in a, in, a, in a small and minor way by comparison that in some universities today, uh, some students seem more intent on point scoring, on political purity, than on building the broad alliances that are necessary for successful social change. They seem to be saying, better, fewer, but purer. That goes against the whole history of progressive change in Britain, where change has come about, whether it be the Chartists, the suffragettes, the battle against the poll tax, and many other causes. Those have always been brought about as a result of alliances and coalitions with a wide cross-section of the population, often involving people who have disagreements with each other on other issues. So I've been involved in two very successful campaigns to block attempts by successive governments to inhibit free speech in this country. And in that campaign, I have worked alongside people like David Davis, the Tory MP and now the Brexit minister, who I disagree with on most issues. But when it comes to civil liberties and free speech, he's been very good. So I'm prepared to seek my differences and collaborate with him on these causes. And it's precisely because of our collaboration that we've twice successfully persuaded conservative governments in the last few years to drop plans or to amend legislation that inhibited free speech. So working together with people you may not entirely agree with is fundamental. Finding fault in other people, the idea that you make one mistake and you're out, which is a lot of, I'm sad to say, a lot of left-wing politics these days, that is not the way to build progressive change. My heart breaks when I think of the many good people on the liberal, left, green side of politics who maybe said one thing out of place, unintentional through ignorance and a lack of understanding, but not intentionally and they've been demonized and cast out. That's the sort of sectarian nature of some student politics today, 
And I think we really have to challenge it because it's not the way that open debate should proceed and it's not the way that we should operate in a decent civilized society. So what I want to do is perhaps particularly look at this whole issue of free speech in universities uh, and start by saying that I am a very passionate defender of free speech and very concerned about the way in which some university student unions are imposing overzealous restrictions on who can speak on campus and what they can say. It's a policing of ideas, a policing of thought, a policing of speech. I think that universities ought to be places, and indeed schools and the whole of society, ought to be a place where ideas can be contested and debated. Bad ideas are most effectively defeated by good ideas, by better ideas. Obviously backed with evidence, counter-arguments, logic ethics, but not crude bans. Banning something doesn't make it go away. If you ban a speaker who has unpalatable ideas, you don't challenge him or her or their supporters. You don't change hearts and minds, you just suppress that idea. But that idea, and the advocate of that idea, and their supporter of that, supporters of those ideas, continue unchallenged. So they actually let off the hook by having bans. But I am very alarmed by recent government proposals that are going to require university authorities to indiscriminately clamp down on student bodies that for any reason, no platform speakers or restrict them via safe space policies. For those who don't know, the National Union of Students has a no platform policy against six racist or fascist organizations. Some universities have safe space policies where within student meetings, it's deemed a safe space where certain things can't be said or speakers have to behave in a certain way. Um, the idea and the intention of a no platform and safe space is commendable. You know, we don't want black and ethnic minority pupils being racially abused in a meeting. We don't want women being shouted down. We don't want abusive, insulting language directed against LGBT people. And we don't want minority voices to be overlooked. So it's all dominated by a handful of very articulate, loud people. So the safe space policy has got a good intention. The problem is it's often much more widely interpreted in a way that actually does inhibit free speech. So Joe Johnson, who was the university's minister, is planning to allow the newly created Office for Students to fine, suspend, or deregister universities that fail to protect freedom of speech on campus. Um, university administrators under this plan will have a duty to uphold free speech by staff, by students, by student unions, by student societies. Now, the principle may be fine, but it seems unworkable to me. Why should the onus be placed upon the university administration and not on the students whose actions the minister objects to? He seems to be going to target the universities who are just the body that oversees the university, they're not the ones, in most cases, who are implementing or enforcing the no platform and safe space policy. Um, as I'm sure you will agree that freedom of speech is one of the most precious of all human rights. A free society depends on the free exchange of ideas. But some students, and it is only some, justify no platforms and safe spaces in the name of not causing offence, even though nearly all ideas can potentially cause offence to someone. So they seem to be saying now that you can't cause offence, you mustn't cause offence. Now, I just take a look at your history. Many of the most important ideas in human history, such as those as Galileo Galilei, Karl Marx, Charles Darwin, Sigmund Freud, or closer to home, Richard Dawkins, some of their ideas have caused great offence in their time. I don't think there is a right to not be offended. There's no human rights statute which says 
people must be protected against offence, that it's illegal to cause offence. But some students and others are now claiming this is or should be the case. I think that's very, very dangerous because where do you draw the line and who decides? A, a survey in 2016 by Spiked Online magazine found that 63% of university students support the National Union of Students policy of no platform. 63%, nearly two thirds. Analysis published also by Spiked last year in 2017 claimed that nearly two thirds of universities actively censor speech and that another third stifle speech to excessive regulation. The total, that's a total of over 90%. Sounds quite scary. But in fact, it's not as alarming as it sounds because in many cases, the restrictions were minor and did not diminish the free exchange of ideas. So for example, in my view, if a university requires a speaker to sign a declaration that they won't incite violence, they won't harass, they won't demand segregation based on gender, I don't think that's an infringement of free speech. I think it's just ensuring that a debate or a discussion or a meeting goes ahead on reasonable grounds. <clears throat> but nevertheless, influenced by that research, the former minister for universities, Joe Johnson, justified his proposals as follows, and I quote, our young people and students need to accept the legitimacy of healthy, vigorous debate in which people can disagree with each other. That's how ideas get tested, prejudice is exposed, and society advances. Universities mustn't be places in which free speech is stifled. Now, I can't disagree with that. You know, it reflects my own ethos and those of us across the spectrum who defend free speech. But although it's a laudable sentiment, the plan to penalize university authorities, as I mentioned, <coughs> seems ill thought out and oblivious to the potentially incendiary consequences. What it will do is make universities speech policing institutions. It will put them on collision course with the government and with their own student bodies. So instead of targeting the students, the student societies, the student unions that are doing the infringements and violations of free speech, the government wants to put the onus and the penalties on the university authorities. And I fear that this could pro provoke a very, very big student revolt. A revolt against the university authorities and a revolt against the government. And I've got to say that if the proposals are too blunt and unqualified, which they appear to be, I will be on the side of the students. I may not agree with everything they do and say, but I think they are right to want to resist this measure. It needs to be more carefully calibrated. It needs to be more refined, more explicit and targeted before I could give my confident support. So many people argue, well, are there any circumstances in which free speech can be legitimately limited? There are some people who say free speech is an absolute, that in all circumstances it should be totally free with no restrictions at all. Um, I don't agree with that. I do agree in most cases, free speech should be unqualified and unregulated, but I can see three instances where free speech can be legitimately limited. The first is when a speaker makes false damaging allegations. Damaging allegations that could have a very negative effect on the person named. So for example, if I said that a member of parliament in this area was a paedophile, a tax fraudster, and so on, it could 
not only cause that person great emotional and mental distress, it could actually provoke mob violence against them. So that, to me, is a red line. The second instance is where a person makes sustained threats, harassment, and menaces against another person. You know, again, that is not free speech, because a person who's subjected to those kinds of threats and menaces will feel intimidated and will not feel able and confident to defend themselves and to participate in a debate. They will be fearful. They will withdraw, in many cases, because they feel under sustained attack. This is very different from criticism. Criticism is fine, but when you think about MPs and others who have been vilified online, not once or twice, but hundreds of thousands of times. Remember the woman uh, who fought the campaign to get a woman on the £10 banknote? She was subjected to not days or weeks, but months of sustained online harassment and abuse of a truly foul, obscene, and threatening nature. That is not free speech. That's an abuse of free speech. She stood her ground because she's a very strong, confident, articulate woman. But many other people that I know personally have been driven out of the public sphere by this toxic campaign that they've been subjected to. The third example, where I think free speech can be legitimately restricted, is when someone um, advocates or incites violence. So if you're going to incite violence against Jews, Muslims, or a particular person, then again, I think that's a red line. Because again, that person or that community under attack will be fearful, so fearful, that many of them, or most of them, will not feel confident to participate. They will fear the consequences. So, for example, in Jamaica a decade ago, when some leading reggae and dancehall singers put out tracks advocating the murder of LGBT people, saying that LGBT people should be hanged, shot, gassed, drowned, etc., the local LGBT group was too afraid to speak out because they feared being murdered. They feared that these incitements would lead to people trying to kill them. So they were not able to participate in the public debate. They weren't able to appear on television or even the radio because they feared being tracked and discovered and killed. So those are the three instances where I think that free speech can be legitimately limited. There is perhaps a fourth one, which we have seen in some British universities, and that is where a speaker demands gender segregation, that men and women should be forced to sit separately. And these are mostly Islamist extremists who believe that women are inferior and unclean and that they should be kept away from men. That is a misogynistic, sexist view. And it's very, very shameful that some universities, not recently, but even a few, just a few years ago, were complying with these demands and forcing women to set separately at meetings where these Islamist extremists spoke. So that's a, that's a fourth example where I think people who demand that, they should not have a right to speak. That right should be abrogated because universities have an obligation to abide by our quality laws which prohibit discrimination based upon gender, race, etc. I mentioned that um, the NUS, National Union of Students, No Platform Policy, includes only six allegedly racist and fascist organizations. And they are El Harun, the British National Party, English Defense League, Hizbut Tahir, Muslim Public Affairs Committee, and National Action. Three far-right, predominantly white, extremist organizations, and three Islamist extremist organizations. And these are banned because they do not support human rights. They do not support democracy. Their members have been involved in violent attacks and threats against other people. And so therefore, I totally agree that those six organizations should be banned because they are a threat 
and they have been shown to be a threat, and again, their threats close down debate. As I mentioned also, the no platform policy has been more widely interpreted by some student unions and societies. So for example, there was an attempt by a section of the National Union of Students to ban Nick Lowell's, the director of the anti-racist group Hope Not Hate, because he had opposed far-right Islamists. Equally, there was an attempt to, or several attempts, to ban Mariam Namazi, an Iranian communist and feminist, because she had been critical of Islamist extremists. She spoke out against those extremists who were saying that under Sharia law, um, ex-Muslims, apostates, blasphemers, LGBT people, and women who have sex outside of marriage should be killed. And they were actively inciting their supporters to support that view. They're actively endorsing, glorifying, encouraging, and um, legitimating the murder of those groups of people. Another person who was victimized was Kate Smirthwaite. She was barred from speaking at Goldsmith College in London on the grounds that she had uh, opposed sex workers and supported a ban on prostitution or clients of prostitutes. Now, I don't agree with her views, but she was not advocating any diminution of those people's rights, except for this issue of criminalization. She wasn't using abusive language, she wasn't harassing them, she wasn't threatening them. I think she was wrong, but in my view, she was not crossing any of the four red lines that I outlined. Um, I was also a victim at Christ Church University in Kent in 2016. I wasn't actually no-platformed, but the NUS LGBT officer, Fran Cowling, refused to speak at a student meeting if I was on the platform. Now, I defended her right not to speak alongside me. She has every right to not speak if I'm on the platform. But the way she phrased it, it almost seemed like an ultimatum to the university. It's either me or him. And obviously, perhaps hoping the university would pick her rather than me. But what I really objected to was the fact that when challenged, she justified her position by saying that I was racist and transphobic. So privately, I tried, I did contact her, and asked her, you know, I was very surprised about this allegation, where is the evidence? And of course, there was none. She couldn't provide any evidence, and neither could any of her allies or supporters in the National Union of Students, because those allegations are simply untrue. Now, drilling down, some people eventually said, ah, you signed a letter to the Observer, which was transphobic. It's true I signed a letter to the, to the Observer, but it wasn't a transphobic letter. It was a letter criticizing the campaign of intimidation and violence against feminists who are critical of trans or some aspects of trans issues. Um, these feminists were not inciting violence against trans people. They were not saying that trans people should be denied equal rights, but they were critical of aspects of the trans agenda. Now, I don't agree with them, and I've criticized feminists like Julie Bindle, Germaine Greer, and others who have made quite derogatory remarks about trans people. I don't share their view, but I do share the view that they should not be subjected to intimidation and violence. I support protests against them. You know, I, I supported pickets of Germaine Greer when I think she spoke at Oxford or Cambridge. Um, I supported people writing letters, expressing their disagreement and signing petitions. I supported people getting up in the meeting and challenging Jermaine Greer and others. But I didn't think they should be banned, which is what that letter 
was opposing. It was saying they should not be subjected to violence and they should not be banned from speaking. And on that basis, I was told I was transphobic. I was against trans people because I defended free speech. Even though I made it absolutely clear, I support protests against these people, I do not agree with them. So that can sh is a very good example of how the way in which some sections of student politics have gone and are going. Um, I mentioned earlier the safe space policy. You know, it is very commendable in its principle. The idea of a safe space policy in a university is to ensure that students, including women, racial, sexual, and gender minorities, are not victimized or overlooked in debates. So I can look back on my own student past and think, how often white, straight men often dominated debates. And women and black and minority people, disabled people and others, would rarely get a look in. It was dominated by very articulate, powerful, strident men. So the safe space policy is designed to correct that, to make sure that all, vo all voices are heard. And I think that's a good thing. But again, it has been subjected to excessive interpretations. At Edinburgh University in 2016, student Immigrant Wilson was threatened with ejection from a meeting after she raised her hand and shook her head in disagreement with what a speaker was saying. She didn't abuse him or interrupt him, she just shook her head and raised her hand but it was deemed that her actions violated the Student Union Safe Space Policy, which prohibits, quote, gestures which denote disagreement. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. In the end, the vote to eject her was lost, though it was a relatively modest margin. So again, it shows that you can have these great, great policies with good intentions, but there are zealous people out there he will try and enforce them in very undemocratic, unfree ways. So going back to the government's proposals uh, about universities, I think the main problem is what will be the red lines? The government has not spelt that out. When it talks about saying you can't shut down free speech, obviously, I'm sure the government like me must have in its mind certain circumstances where free speech can be legitimately restricted, such as incitements to violence. But it hasn't spelt this out. So the big fear is that the government will draw the interpretation or the limits or the boundaries very widely in ways that may limit and restrict genuine free speech. You know, atheist, secularist, and humanist societies at lots of universities have had great trouble for displaying posters of Jesus and Mo, um, a reference to Jesus and Muhammad. Even holding meetings, they've had great difficulty because some students, mostly Muslim students, have taken great offense. And I can understand why those students may take offense, but as I said before, there is no right to not be offended. You know, if you feel confident in your faith, you ought to be able to stand up and defend it. You should not feel threatened by an atheist, secularist, and humanist society, and you shouldn't, as some Muslim organizations have tried to do, prevent atheist, secularist, and humanist groups having stalls at freshers' fairs, prevent them from holding meetings, tearing down their posters. That is not acceptable. By all means, Muslim students are welcome to go there and protest outside the meeting or inside the meeting to ask questions, to present their own point of view, that's great. I absolutely defend that. And indeed, I also defend the right of people to protest against me. Only a little lonely last week, I was speaking at the London School of Economics, and someone got up and started ranting against the way in which the meeting was being conducted, directed at me and the chair. I said, fine, let's hear your point of view. We'll give you some minutes. You tell us what you think is wrong. At Hull University, um, before Christmas, I had a picket 
uh, of one of my lectures, and I, well, I welcomed the students to come in, and I said, I'll give you five minutes to, to make your point of view. That's what a free society should be about. That's what open debate should be about. I don't say I reserve the right to protest, but no one can protest against me. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. I defend the right of people to protest against me, just as much as I defend the right to protest against them. So, as I said, the government's red lines are very unclear. And how they're going to be interpreted is very unclear. Uh, my big fear is that it will be a very subjective interpretation, that it will be open to inconsistencies and misuse. Um, so the government has not said there will be exemptions to respect, restrict free speech where it involves abuse, harassment, and violence. It hasn't said that. It hasn't said we're going to make sure that these things are not tolerable, but everything else is. Um, there are plentiful people in history who've argued for free speech. People of all political persuasions. But just think, Rosa Luxemburg, John Stuart Mill, Mahandras Gandhi, and many others have argued that freedom of speech means nothing if it doesn't exist for the person who thinks differently. Students and government, please take note. Thank you. <laughs>